sermon this morning, it is still morning, is about a lie where the entire world has been lied to. And the nose of the world is growing longer and longer and more and more people are believing the lie and then they turn around and they are living the lie. The rich man and Lazarus. We're going to take a close look at that. Let's pray together. Father, we live in perilous times. Right now we're watching news or hear about it or read about it from a distance. It's other countries, it is other people. It's somebody else's country's refugees. It's not Germany or Sweden or England. We're not in pairs. We don't have to fear. But Lord, I prepare for the day when the winds of strife are no longer held back by your graceful hand. I pray that we can learn to put our trust in nothing but Jesus Christ. Not in Washington, not in politics, not in constitutions, not what's in the back of our pickup or above the back seat bench, not in stock markets or retirement plans or HEBs and Walmarts. But I pray that before the day comes, You will teach us trust. Father, we also pray for the Muslim world that we have an opportunity to reach them and convert many. We pray for the secular world that our lifestyle, our daily living, our preaching, our glow tracks, our programs, and our face-to-face contacts might be a genuine witness. We pray we're not just church, Sabbath morning, potluck and haystacks, new building with, with payments. I pray we can be the living body of Christ. And now teach us from Scripture a difficult story with a simple lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't believe a lie. Now, I was too slow to change my sermon title in the bulletin. I'm going to have to explain that one, or you will really wonder about me. Um, The story today is about the rich man and Lazarus, and I've heard interpretations of that. I've I've studied it, uh, and it never fully made sense. It's in Luke chapter 16. The rich man and Lazarus. It seems to clearly say that when you die, you go to heaven or hell immediately. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Luke 16, 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day, but there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abram's bosom. And I'm thinking, good luck, Seventh-day Adventists, with the state of the dead. It just does not fit. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, you notice, the rich man fits the Adventist theory a little better. He dies and he gets buried. And being in torments in Hades, he... Ah. What do we do with that? He lifted up his eyes and saw Abram afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, so they're within communication distance. Father Abram, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, 
Remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. But you can talk to each other. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father Abraham, that you would send him to my father's house for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, very important verse, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. So they got the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And they should listen to that. Verse 30, and he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead... They will repent. Verse 31, But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. What do, you, what do we do with this story? I'm going to prove to you the state of the dead from this story, but that will not be my final point. But let me walk you through this story. The entire world has been told a lie about hell. And I have to tell the world, hell, no. That is a lie from Babylon, and it's drunk by people that we call wine bibbers, and their nose gets longer and longer. And here's why. We are discussing uh, in our sermons here this year, 2015, Revelation 14. And I need you to take a close look at Revelation 14, the first and the second angel's message. There seems to be a parallel structure. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, the, the question of where is answered with an angel flying as high as he can in the sky in the midst of heaven. Babylon, on the other hand, is as low as possible. It's not just fallen, it is fallen, fallen. That is how the ancients used the highlighter, turned the print into bold print, and increased the font to 72. When you say it twice, you mean it. It is not just fallen, it, it is crashed down as low as you can. So we got the first angel as high as possible, the second angel talking to Babylon, which is as low as possible. That is the location. Then the first angel has a message, the eternal gospel. So does the second angel saying Babylon, the message of hers, the wrath of her fornication, which is really adultery. Then it addresses who? First angel addresses all the nations, and so does the second angel. That means the message is global. And Prophecy Spotlight events this week were global events. So everybody needs to be addressed. And they, I think, might just be in competition with each other. There's a lie that is trying to arrest the attention of the world, and the truth is a trying to arrest the attention of the world, including in Kenya through jail, starting next week. And then we have an action, and this is very important to understand this. The, I already had a sermon on the first angel, but you remember that the call to worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water is a direct quote from the fourth commandment. Exodus chapter 20 verse 11 also has a call to him who made the heaven and the earth, not the springs of water but the sea. So the appeal is to a not just creator God but the creator God who instituted Sabbath. Would it not make sense then that a competing entity wants to mess up this, and sure enough, Babylon tries to make you drink of the wine. Now, think about this for a second. This is a lecture sermon. What is wine? Already had a sermon on that as well. Wine is a mocker. It used to be grape juice, but it got corrupted. Okay? Let me go back to the previous slide here. There is Sabbath, but the Sabbath got corrupted into something else. 
There's the state of the dead. When you're dead, you're actually dead. I know that's profound. You know, when, when you die, you're dead. That got corrupted to now theology is saying, when you die, you're not dead. And the nose grows longer and longer. Okay. So what I think is happening with this second angel's message is an angel warning saying there used to be something good, grape juice, Sabbath, state of the dead, Bible truth, but it got corrupted. Don't believe a lie. The nose is getting longer and longer. I looked at uh, human history and I found that there's truth from the Bible and, and we had grapes turned into wine. We have Sabbath turned into something else, and we got the state of the dead turned into something else. And I'm wondering out loud here, if Ellen White does not mention Islam very much in the great controversy, I have Adventist friends who say she missed it, and now we have evangelists saying Islam, Islam, Islam. I'm wondering, is she right? And things will be played out just like she says. And all the other stuff right now going on is just a painful, painful smokescreen for something much bigger that will take us off guard. So we're going to take a look at this story, The Rich Man and Lazarus. I, I think I have something for you that will make sense and will make a tremendous difference in your life beyond prophecy and uh, just pondering the, the Bible. Lazarus is so close that he could have been burned up, but he's still far enough away. He's in heaven. The rich man went to hell, and, and he can see the flames. What do we do with this story? I'm going to give you four key points, then unpack them, and then pull it all together before 1230. Rich man and Lazarus in 30 minutes or less. Okay. Around the world in 60 minutes. In verse 25, Luke 16 suggests that your eternal destiny is determined when? During your lifetime. Now, I grew up in, in Lutheran Catholic Germany thinking that when you die and you were really bad, you go to hell. If we were really bad but not too bad, you can go to a place called purgatory, still repent, and then make it back out. Smelling a little bit like smoke, but not too bad. That's a lie. That's a lie. Within the parable itself, verse 25 seems to indicate your lifetime determines your eternal destiny. Do not wait till your deathbed. Point number two. Verse 31 is saying you have to base your life on Scripture not on supernatural phenomena, on, on people coming back from the dead. Okay? Scripture, not the supernatural. Number three, in parables, the points of the story must never distract from the point of the story. If I told you a story, uh, let me illustrate to you prophecy. Once upon a time in Wonderland, Alice walked along a road. Would you believe that I'm telling you a true story that happened last week at Walmart? You would know I'm telling you a fable, and I'm trying to illustrate a point. But by tr illustrating a true point, that does not make Alice in Wonderland a true story. And by the way, children, there is no Santa Claus. I'm sorry, I apologize. Yeah, the points of the story, there might be untrue points, but they add up to a true point. Let me illustrate. The context, which is number four, context is very important. I mean, uh, Luke himself says, caution, not a true story. Okay? Luke 14, 16, a certain man. Luke, Luke 15, 11, a certain man. Luke 16, 1, there was a certain rich man. Everybody knew when the rich man and Lazarus is being retold by Jesus, this is not going to be a point-for-point -point true story. How can Jesus tell that story, though? Context. Just before the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus talks about a guy who owes a lot of money to a CEO, and the accountant says, boss is out of town. 
let me change a zero and a comma and a period on the Excel spreadsheet. You will owe less and you can walk home debt free. Deal? Guy who owes the money says, uh, great idea. Thank you very much. Jesus says we ought to be more like those people. No, wait a minute. Really? We ought to cheat. Not the point of the story. Do you know what the point of that story is? Look what the people of the world are doing for each other. How much more, in an honest way, should church members help each other out? Jesus is not endorsing cheating on your income tax or on the Excel spreadsheet. He's saying if wicked people help each other, we should help one another as well. Let me give you a little more clear example. I had a piano teacher who came out of a concert hall. Uh, where is Kenton? Nine foot Steinway is my guess. Uh, there he is. He came out of a concert hall and um, he had his car parked in a dark alley and there was a, a man relieving himself at his car. Okay, how, how do I say that politely in, in English? There we go. Yeah, yeah. The points of a parable. Parable. And, and my piano teacher thought, what is this guy doing at my car? Before he got to his car, now how do I say this in English? Uh, a lady of the night, parents explain later, a lady of the night walked up to that guy at the car and he said, don't do that, that's somebody's car. Okay? My piano teacher walked up and said, thank you <laughs> uh, for telling that guy to to move on. And then my piano teacher said the following quote. Now watch how important context is. We should be more like this lady. <laughs> Telling somebody doing something wrong, they ought to stop doing it. Okay? Context, context, context. And this uh, story of the rich man and Lazarus has a context as well. Throughout the entire Bible, many, many texts say our reward happens at the second coming, not at the point of death. And I'm quoting a very critical commentary that does not believe in the resurrection of Jesus or Sabbath or Ellen White. But even a, a, a European secular commentary says the following. The general principle is maintained that bliss and misery after death are determined by conduct previous to death. Okay, your lifetime right now counts. But the details of the picture are taken from Jewish beliefs as to the, notice that, not scriptural beliefs, Jewish beliefs, as to the condition of souls in Sheol and must not be understood as confirming those beliefs. Those secular scholars got that part right. The Pope got it right to a degree and then messes it up. That's the previous Pope. I can quote him because he's German. Listen to what Pope Benedict says about the rich man and Lazarus. Interesting. He admits, the Pope admits, previous Pope, in the description of the next life that now follows in the parable, Jesus uses ideas that were current in the Judaism of the time, not in Scripture. Hence, we must not force our interpretation of this part of the text. Jesus adopts existing images without formally incorporating them into his teaching about the next life. And I'm not going to say in the pulpit with possibly a recording going, Amen, Pope. I'm uh, not going to say that. Because watch what he says next. In plain English, the Pope is saying, you cannot trust the detailed points to describe the actual reality, what happens when you die. Right? Watch what he says next. And I changed his name to his real name, Josef Cardinal Ratzinger. In a book uh, called Jesus, page 215, I read it cover to cover. He says, nevertheless, Jesus does unequivocally affirm the substance of the images. He just contradicted what he just said. In this sense, it is important to note that Jesus invokes here the idea of the intermediate state between death and the resurrection, possibly purgatory, which by then had become part of the universal patrimony uh, knowledge of Jewish faith. Jesus says nothing about a resurrection in death here. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Good thing there is no video going right now. He just denies what he said previously. The Pope is now saying there is an intermediate state of death and 
Jesus does not talk about the resurrection. Guess what Jesus talks about in Luke chapter 16, verse 31? The resurrection. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Rutzinger, but we, we're going to have to research a little more here. The, the Jews thought Abram's bosom was the blessed state of the dead. Now, let me ask you how many people would fit into Abram's bosom. I need to record your reaction because this is precisely what Jesus is after. You're laughing at the story. You're laughing at somebody else's lie. Now stay with me a little longer. In Matthew 8, 11, Jesus says, I say to you, many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So where is Abraham going to be? In the kingdom of heaven. Very important. He, he is not ne anywhere near the, the fiery flames of, of hell. And Josephus, and then it's going to get a little easier, but a couple of quotes. Josephus was a, a Jewish scholar. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, he got smart and said, if you can't beat them, join them. He was a traitor. He left the Jewish people and joined the Romans. And then he came up with the following statements. And the Jews started believing a lie about death. Listen to this. Josephus said, it's like an elder at the synagogue. Okay? Hades is a subterraneous region where the light of this world does not shine. This region is allowed as a place of custody for souls in which angels are appointed as guardians to them who distribute to them temporary punishments agreeable to everyone's behaviors and manners. And then he also says, Angels bring the souls of the righteous dead to the place we call the bosom of Abraham, but the unrighteous in the neighborhood of hell itself, a chaos deep and large is fixed between them, insomuch that just a just man that has compassion upon them cannot be admitted, nor can one that is unjust if he were bold enough to attempt it, pass over it. So he's suggesting they're close uh, neighborhoods, hell and heaven. Okay. Now, what is interesting is those stories floated around the entire Middle East. I'm going to give you several examples and then show you what Jesus is actually doing with the rich man and Lazarus. Okay, stay with me. In Egypt, there was a magician named C. Osiris. He returned from the land of the dead, reincarnated into a poor family of Setmi. Then there was a funeral, funeral with honors for the rich man, and funeral for the poor man. He had to live among the, among the dead. Okay? There's a place called Necropolis in Egypt. Nancy and I have driven by there. Uh, people live in a cemetery. With the dead. Yeah, exactly. E. E. And um, the conclusion in Setmi's family is, it's better to be rich and die with honors than to be poor and end up living among the dead. Uh, dead alive. Okay. And, and Osiris says, no, 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 no. Everything will be reversed in death. The rich will suffer and the poor will will have a banquet. That's a lie. Okay? That's a lie that an entire culture uh, perpetuates. Then we have a Jewish story called Bar Mayan Tale. There's a rich tax collector. He dies. He gets a big funeral. And a poor Bible scholar, a Sabbath school teacher, so to speak, he gets a plain funeral. And the conclusion is, it's better to be rich and die than to be poor and die. Lesson of the story, no, in death everything is reversed. The rich will suffer and the poor will rejoice in the bosom of Abraham. Is that what will happen? Not exactly like it because when you're dead, you are dead. Okay? Then the Greek culture also had the same imagery. Three men die, that sounds like a bad joke with a bar involved. <laughs> but that's how the story goes. Okay? Three men die, they go to Hades, the place of the dead, and there's a rich guy, I can't even, well, I could pronounce that, but uh, uh, Brother M, and the other guy, the poor guy, and a philosopher. And sure enough, in death, 
not, not, no resurrection, no second coming. Just in death, all the fortunes are reversed and the poor people on earth are rich and the rich people on earth become poor. Okay? So we got Egypt, Jewish culture, Greek culture, all saying the same thing. Then we have Plato, philosopher. He gets, talks about a guy killed in battle. The guy visits Hades sees the judgment, okay, he died, but he's still alive. Then he's sent back to earth to, to warn the living people, watch how you live. Okay? Be careful, there's a judgment coming. Once you die, you're dead. Once you die, you remain dead, except for Moses and a few exceptions at uh, Jesus' cross and resurrection. So story after story, the entire world is being told a lie that when you die, you're not dead. Do you know where that lie comes from? All the way back to the Garden of Eden and the world has believed ever since. Do you know what's behind this? Behind that is the idea that you human beings do not have to make a decision. You don't have to make up your mind about God while you're still alive because you get a second chance after you die. So live any way you want. It doesn't matter. You can change your destiny after death. That is a long-nosed lie. Don't believe a lie. I, I have more examples for you, but I'm going to skip that. Babylonian Talmud. I was uh, there where they copied that book, Tiberius Israel, three summers ago. They are still working on this project okay, after thousands of years. Uh, well, this is an interesting one. It involves children. Uh, Samuel, the prophet, he deposits money with his father, Abba. Abba means father. Unfortunately, Abba, the father, dies. Bur he's already buried the money, and he didn't tell anybody where the money is buried. So guess what Samuel has to do? He has to visit the land of the dead, ask Abba, who is dead, where the money is, and then Abba tells him, he comes back to the living, Samuel does, and he restores the money to the orphans. That, that doesn't work that way. Uh, more stories about the Egyptians and, and their miracles. Don't believe a lie in life. That's what this second angel is saying. Here's what Jesus is doing with that story. He's retelling a lie, and while he's retelling the story, he says, can you believe that? And he's shaking his head, no. Think about this. I, I just grasped uh, four points on what I think Jesus is doing with that story. He's saying, can you believe it? There are people who are saying you can be filled with crumbs. It doesn't work that way. He's retelling the story that the world is telling to the world. And Jesus shaking his head. Can anybody be filled and satisfied by catching the crumbs off the table? Can you do that? No, you cannot. That's a lie. Jesus is retelling the story, shaking his head, saying, you can't believe the story that the world is telling. Number one. Number two. Is Abraham's bosom literal? So Abraham gets resurrected, and all of us who are saved will live in Abraham's bosom. That, that's a strange picture, okay? Um, we usually, in preaching evangelism, we don't make appeals. How many of you want to accept Abraham's bosom? <laughs> How many of you want to go to Abraham's bosom? No, we want to go to heaven, and we want to go to the new earth, not to Abraham's bosom. In Luke 16, 24, there's a guy actually burning in the flames and he's having a normal conversation with Abram and Lazarus. Um, I've had people tell me that I cannot believe in a God who lets people suffer in the flames of hell. It is one of the number one reasons for atheists to be atheists because how can a loving God roast people in the fires of hell? And Jesus is saying, retelling the story, he's shaking his head saying, this is not what's going to happen. He's saying, the world is telling that story. My father and scripture is not. Don't believe a lie. And number four, 
Okay? You are super thirsty. You, you are dying of thirst. You can make it without water for three days. You are on day number three and a half. Can you quench somebody's thirst who's dying of thirst with one drop of water dipped into a glass put on their tongue? No. Line after line in the story of Lazarus, Jesus is saying, the story does not work this way. It's a lie. Your, your thirst cannot be quenched by one drop of water. Okay? So what Jesus is doing, retelling the story, he's using sarcasm, shaking his head, laughing at the lie, so to speak, that the world is telling. Now, what's the point of the story? Jesus tells us at the end of the parable. He's saying, don't believe a lie. What you should do instead is, number one, go to Moses and the prophets. You need scripture and the spirit of prophecy if you want to understand how the world works, what to do about death, and how to prepare for the second coming. Scripture and spirit of prophecy. Okay, Moses and the prophets. The rich man objects. And he says, no, I want a testimony from the dead. Jesus says a second time when somebody, including Jesus himself, says something twice, you think he means it? He says, no testimony from the dead. You must go to Scripture and the prophets. Okay? Moses and the prophets. Now, there's something interesting behind this. In, in Jewish philosophy, Abraham plays a big role. Do you know what Lazarus is translated into Hebrew? Eliezer, who happens to be Abraham's servant. In, in Genesis 15, Abraham has a servant. It would make sense to send the servant of Abraham, and Jesus says, no servant of Abraham. If you want to know how life works, how, how reality is shaped by God, where do you need to go? Moses and the prophets. Okay? Lazarus is not being sent from the other side. Do you now realize how important personal Bible study becomes? Don't believe a lie. Jesus directly saying twice, go to Scripture. All the information is contained in here. A couple more things. Deuteronomy 18 verse 10. Here comes a, a strong warning, okay? And this is not because of a mean God or a God who likes to punish people. God gives strong warnings when there's a lot at stake and something is very important. Deuteronomy 18 verse 10 says, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells or medium or spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. Do not contact the dead. I got a phone call one time from a Catholic family. Do you know why Catholic families call Adventist pastors? Because we are first in the phone book. Adventist, Assembly of God, Baptist, Catholic, Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, Episcopalians. Okay? Don't list yourself under S for seventh day. Um, Catholic family called me and said, my, there, there are voices in our home. This is not off the internet. This is from, from me. I said, I'll be right over. <clears throat> now, out of a courtesy, after I get to visit, I call the Catholic priest and say, I dealt with your people. And then four weeks later, I drop off an amazing fact study guide. They called me. I didn't call them. Um, I, I came to the family, and, and they said, um, we hear voices in our house. I said, okay, uh, let's do a background check. Well, what do you guys do? <clears throat> and they said, nothing. And I saw teenagers in the back room giggling. And I said, hey, guys, what are you doing? And they said, nothing. Now, I like to translate languages. And I've learned that nothing means something. What are you doing? Nothing. 
Tim Jones, you ever asked a group of people, what are you guys doing? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, that means something. And I found out they were into Ouija boards, tarot cards, levitation. They were trying to make a glass float and contacting the dead. I had to tell the parents, I wish I had been more aggressive and burned the stuff on site. I said, unless you get rid of that stuff, <clears throat> you're going to have problems in your home. Contacting the dead involved the death penalty in the Old Testament. That means God is dead serious about this. Right? Ironically, Jesus said, I have a case study for you. I'm going to prove it. What it takes to get somebody from the dead back, it involves a resurrection. Lazarus died, <clears throat> which made no sense. He got sick. They called Jesus. Would you help Lazarus? He's sick. He's your friend. Jesus said, <clears throat> no. Unanswered prayer. Okay? No response. No testimony Wednesday night for prayer meeting. He died. Okay? Embarrassment to the church. People in the community said, I thought your Jesus can heal. What happened? Okay? The ridicule. He dies, Jesus goes up to the tomb, and he says, come out. Not come up, not come out, just or, or come down, just come out, come out of the tomb. Did the Jews then believe Jesus? A resurrection didn't do it either. Jesus is saying, <clears throat> if you want to base your faith on anything... You need the scriptures and what I have told you. Amen. That will solve y y your framework for life and death. Don't believe a lie. One more step, <clears throat> and we will sing 449. If you should not believe a lie, what else? Don't live a lie either. And that's where you need to go home and ask yourself, am I believing a lie the way I'm living my life? And am I living a lie? March from error to truth. Uh, as Seth said, the end. <clears throat> 449, because he lives, I can face tomorrow.